Our first scripture reading today will be in unison. It's from Luke chapter 8, verses 43 to 48. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years, and though she had spent all she had on physicians, no one could cure her. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his clothes, and immediately her hemorrhage stopped. Then Jesus asked, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and press in on you. But Jesus said, someone touched me, for I noticed that power had gone out from me. When the woman saw that she could not remain hidden, she trembled and falling down before him. She declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Good. All right, so we just read a story about a woman who was healed by Jesus and um, she had been left out of everything because she was, had been sick. Have you ever not been able to, this is so funny with COVID, have you ever not been able to do something with everybody else because, uh, because you've been hurt or injured or sick? Sam? Jack? When you broke your arm, that's, that's a good, like, have, have you ever been invited to something where everybody's able to swim and you can't because you have, like, a cast on or something like that? Yeah, if you get the, the cat, it's can't, right? That's exactly, so you know what that's like. I think all of us, yes, Owen. Okay, so you're not able to swim unless somebody helps you. Okay, that's, that's good, too. That's a good example, too, that the way that, um, that we need to help each other and be mindful, thinking about other people and not just ourselves. Has, and I think we've talked about this before. Have you ever been something where you felt like you were left out? Have you ever been at something where you felt like you didn't get included? Right, that's or like there's a bunch of older kids and you're just you're the youngest one and they're like kind of doing their own thing and you're like, hey, you know, right? That happens, right? Um, or so in this story that we just read, there's this woman who has been left out of a lot of things for a very, 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 very long time. Right? Stop saying very. Right. She was at, and Jesus was able to heal her, but the, most, the more important thing, I don't want to say it's more important, but because she was healed, she was able to be part of the community again because she had something that people, they didn't want to be around her because they were afraid, it, this isn't quite true, but we're going to put it this way, but they were afraid of getting it, whatever she had, right? So they didn't want, she wasn't included now, have any of you been, um, yes, Owen? If somebody comes close to you, sometimes you're, okay, yeah. To, gosh, we used to play a game when I was a kid. Somebody had cooties, right? Does that still exist? Do cooties still exist? I don't know. Okay, forget it, forget it, forget it. Ask, ask your grandparents. Ask your grandparents about cooties. It's a game where you go, you've got cooties, you're it. It's kind of like you're it. And then, ah, Jack has cooties, and everybody runs. Okay. Yes. At my school, they play cheese. They play, they play what? Cheese touch. Cheese touch. Is that the similar game? Cheese. Cheese. Cheese, cheese touch. Uh huh. Because we don't like cheese? Okay, all right, so just so you know, it's from the book Diary of a Wimpy Kid, and it's about moldy cheese. All right, so, all right, so moving on. All right, so 
part of being when you are with friends at, and or at you know at school or anywhere you can be, right? And if you notice that there's somebody off to the side who's not who just needs to be invited to be part of, that is such a blessing to be able to include people. My I brought my kids to a church once to a church activity, and nobody talked to us, right? And I, and I was friends with the pastor, and I went to him during the week, and I said, nobody talked to us. You know, you've got some work to do here. And the, the whole youth group was there, and there, and there are my kids just waiting for somebody to say, hey, come hang with us. And they were too, they were, you know, they were nervous and shy, and nobody was brave enough to say, hey, come hang with me. So I want you to be mindful when, when at school there's somebody who's new who comes, who doesn't know anybody, to say, hey, come sit with me. Hey, come hang with us. Hey, come sit at our table. Hey, we want to include, yes, Jack. You would, yeah, we, we, I know we've talked about this before, but yes, yeah, so they, could bring, they have a buddy bench at school. So if somebody's feeling left out and needs to be included, they go sit on the buddy bench and people see them and say, hey, come play with us. Right? I think that is so nice and so brilliant. Are you ready? Do you know what you're making, making this morning or in Sunday school? You're making bread, right? And next week is, next week is World Communion, and you're gonna have, we're going to have a special communion service with you and your families, which I'm really looking forward to. Shall we fold our hands, close our eyes, bow our heads? Dear God, thank you for um, thank you for friends and family. Thank you for a church family. Uh, Lord, help us to be mindful of the folks who need to be included, and to be brave enough to 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 offer that invitation. Hey, come sit with me, talk with me. Let's be friends. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second scripture passage comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 43 to 47. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in our sight, in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So last week, we're doing a series through the book of Acts. Last week, the, the disciples were waiting. Pentecost has happened. And now they are on the move. This past week, I was at a planning retreat for the Early Ministry Institute of the Synod of the, new, of the Northeast for new pastors. And I led an opening exercise that I called the caterpillar to butterfly exercise. And I had the pastors pair up, and for about a half hour, 15 minutes apiece, one would uh, talk for 10 minutes, and then, then the other person would reflect back to them what they heard or get curious, ask questions about what they had to say, uh, lift up any insights that they might have heard. But they were asked to talk about if to think about the time before COVID as we were all caterpillars, right? And what were we eating? What was our business? What was our busyness about? What, where were we headed before we were forced into the, the chrysalis of COVID? The time went really quickly. And by the way, and because I keep continuing to have to relearn this, two people could not be with us, and they were with us on Zoom, in at the retreat center and i one of them had was exposed to covid and was 
wanted to be more safe than sorry, and the other one had a spouse with work obligations that meant that she had to be home with her with her child, but they were able to be included, and I continue to learn from other people how to do this well, but I just, I, learning and relearning that this is ministry moving forward, but they could be with us even though that they could not be with us in person. Anyway, so then the, the time went quickly, and I found out that everybody didn't stay at the time before COVID. They worked all the way through uh, being in COVID. And so as a, and we were a small group, I asked everyone, we listed on, uh, on some newsprint, what was undone for you in the last two years or so? What was done undone in you or in your church? And then, and also, how were you strengthened in the last two plus years? You know, in a chrysalis, a butterfly, you know, a caterpillar is undone to then become the butterfly. And the arms are, are strengthened to be able to fly, to get out of the chrysalis. The arms have to be strengthened enough to then fly when it gets out. So what has been undone for us? What has been undone for our churches? What has been strengthened? Fascinating, fascinatingly, the list of strengths was longer than the list of things that were undone. Then I asked them to go to a place that gives them peace. We've done this exercise. I asked them to close their eyes. Imagine being in a place that gives you peace, a place that, that you just want to drink in. It makes you slow down and just breathe deeply and go, oh, what do you see? What do you smell? What do you hear? What, is this, the, what do you feel? What is the sensation against your skin? And then I said, imagine that a butterfly lands on your hand. And it doesn't fly away as you lift it up to, to really look at it and appreciate it. What color is it? And then I also said, if you're in a cold place, the butterfly is fine. It's a miracle. God is good. Because some people might go, to the, might go to the ski slope for that place that gives them peace. And then I said, the butterfly is a gift, a sign from God that God is with you. And I invited them to breathe deeply and open their eyes. I'd like to believe that we can emerge out of this chrysalis of the last couple years as butterflies with new strengths and resilience, with your faith deepened by the experience. Certainly we are not the same people that we were in March of 2020. Imagine that you are a butterfly in the making or our church is the butterfly. You are the gift to the community. You are the sign that God is with them. And you have these incredible wings with which you are meant to fly. Appreciate for a moment the resilience, the creativity, the strength that you have shown the world in the last couple of years. Admire your wings. Butterflies are meant to, to fly from flower to flower, gathering nectar, which is their sustenance. And imagine you see a, a beautiful flower in the distance, and your instinct tells you you're supposed to get to that flower. That destination or that flower is the vision of the church, where you want to end up. Do you see it clearly, or is it a blur? Could, could we describe the flower as a church? The discernment process that we are in will seek to describe that flower more clearly. But in order to get there, we're going to have to try our wings. But when a butterfly flies, if you've watched and noticed, it doesn't get from A to B directly. It's at the mercy of the wind. And depending on how you frame it, you could say that the butterfly is jostled by the wind, or you could say it's forced to do a little dance. Do we curse the wind? Or do we think of it as ruach, Hebrew, pneuma, Greek, or the breath of God, English? The same word for breath is wind or spirit in both Hebrew and Greek. Getting to that flower is not a straight line. 
And there will be, there will be flowers, there will be uh, sustenance along the way to get to that other destination. I asked the pastors, how are you being nourished in this time? And then we talked about that. We can think about the disciples now, the apostles who are sent out as caterpillars when they were with Jesus, forced into a chrysalis. And now, after Pentecost, being told, go and fly. And this is what they did. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the, the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke the bread and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. There are countless churches today that, that model their ministry on Acts 2, on this passage. Teaching, learning, being students of scripture, fellowship, prayer, and generosity. Now, the question for many of our churches is of who is included in that community? Who is included in, in that generosity of, of spirit and of material need? Several years ago, I was in Cuba and sitting, listening to a, a presentation from a pastor he was, I, I called him the Grand Puba of the Presbyterian Church in Cuba. And he was, he was talking with us. And then in the back, these gentlemen walked in, into the church. And he was just kind of eyeing them and talking. And then finally he goes, hold on a second, I need to. I'm the only one here. I need to go talk to them. And the conversation, they are having a repast after a funeral. And they need they were hoping that the church could help them with seating. They don't have enough seats for everybody. Could they borrow some benches? And we watch uh, Eddie um, get annoyed with them. Why did you wait to the last minute? You know, why, you know the, you, why didn't you arrange this earlier? But, and I thought he was saying no. But then come to find out the men walked up to the balcony and they took these, the benches out with them. And then the woman who had been cooking for us all week shows up. She's all, come to find out she's the clerk of session. She arrives on her bike, and he goes, hold on a second, time out, goes to talk with her to tell her that he allowed some people to take some benches from the church. And we all teased him because we said, you're covering your butt. And he goes, and, and that's exactly what he was doing. But the question remained, what would we do? If somebody that we didn't know came to the church and asked to borrow tables or chairs for some function for their family, would we say yes? Would we say no? We don't know them. Hmm. In ministry, I over the years I have learned that if anybody asks, I, I don't give I don't give loans out. When somebody comes in and 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 there's and if there is a fund for it at the church, not every church does to help people in the community. I never make it a loan. I always make it a gift because I have learned that if you make it a loan, you'll never see it. You'll never see them again. And because if they don't pay it back, then they'll feel guilty, and so they'll just stay away. So I'm like, it's 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 a gift. Don't don't worry about it. No no no. I want to pay, but that's fine. But it's not expected. So years ago. In, in this is, was in Wharton, there, in the, the span of a week, there were like three house fires and people lost their homes. And the secretary at the town hall was also a member of my congregation and she came to me and said, do you think the church would be able to help with security, security deposits for them in, to, in, for apartments? And and I had recently said to somebody that I'm the queen of process. I did not follow the process. I said, yes, we could. I knew we had the money. And I also know how long churches can take to make these decisions, to get everybody together, to debate it, to da 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 And I said, yes. The, the finance person of the church said, Robin was Episcopalian there for a second, and said yes. And, you know, we... 
filled out, you know, had them fill out something, da 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 da. Again, I and just praying. Every every single one of those families paid the money back even before they had left the apartments, and and they were really grateful, and I was really grateful. But the question is, what is our obligation to the larger community? Listen to this. Roman, the Roman Emperor Julian in the 4th century talking about early Christians. Christianity has been specially advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers and through their care for the burial of the dead. It is a scandal that there is not one single Jew who is a beggar and that the godless, and that the godless Galileans care not only for their own poor but for ours as well while those who belong to us look in vain for the help that we should render them. The early church took care of people regardless. They were known for their generosity, for the way they cared for one another and those in need. Now today, in today's world, when I work with churches, many say that they want to grow and be in ministry to the community. And what becomes apparent, and again, this is all human nature, but, and so don't beat yourself up over it, but what what becomes apparent is that they want people to come to worship, fall in love with the same programs and traditions that they love, and that they'll carry them on, you know, forever and ever. Amen. And un- the world has changed, and the people who, who, the nat- the people who would naturally have done that are folks' children, but we become so mobile that they move away, and so they're not there to carry on the traditions. The call of the church is to freely, expecting nothing in return, give, give ourselves away. Our love, our gifts, our encouragement, our friendship, our stories of faith, so that others might walk in the knowledge of God. And there are many ways to do that. We're in a discernment process to get that mental, pic- to get that mental picture of the flower to which God is leading us, and the wind is going to blow us this way and that, but we trust that every dance with the wind brings with it a lesson and a way to strengthen our wings. One of the byproducts of your mission and vision as a church will be community. And the, the other passage that we read t- speaks of a woman who was, and I didn't say this with, with the kids because, you know, she was ritually unclean. Like, what does that mean to, you know, to a little kid? Because of the constant blood flow of this woman, she was considered ritually unclean. She could not participate in worship, and anybody who came into contact with her would not be able to participate in worship, so they did not come into contact with her. So her illness became isolating beyond belief. So her healing was not only physical, it was a return to community. The challenge of the church today is that no one's pushing through the crowd to get a seat at the table. And there's lots of reasons for that, for which the church you know, is, is, uh, is responsible. But the other truth is that there's an epidemic of loneliness in our culture. You know, we're connected, you know, we're connected on the interwebs, but we can turn off the computer and feel twice as lonely as we did when we started. We need companions and friends. And I also want to say some of this is generational. Um, I'm, I'm a Gen Xer, um, and this is, I know this is true for my generation moving down. My parents' generation is a generation of where they got together. And what was there to do on weekends but together with, get together with, with friends? And now we all have, Which is our, you know, which is our, which is our phone, but it's also our television, our movies, our social media, our everything, and we can be a culture that just stares down at a screen instead of looking to one another. I think churches have an ability and a gift of community that we can offer the world because we are so connected but so disconnected. We all need friends and companions to walk this journey of life with each other. Our mission field is wary of churches, wary of pitches, wary of, you know, of what do you really want from me? 
And we're also not quite sure how to make friends. Um, if you didn't um, open the email on Friday, or if again, if you want to get on the list, let me know. There is a uh, resume, a summary of the, uh, timeline story, the timeline storytelling event. And one of your gifts that almost was universally lift up, lifted up is that you are welcoming. You are a welcoming church. Um, I did, if there's little commentary there, and one of the questions is, it, it, the presupposition, we, we love to welcome people in to our space. What if our welcome needs to go out? What if we need to go outside of the building in order to welcome people? And what if we weren't worried about the result? What if we simply preoccupied ourselves with just being loving and generous with, with our welcome, with our gifts? And back to that beginning exercise and listening and hearing people, which is such a gift. At the beginning of the, the retreat this last week, by starting out with that listening piece, the, the bonds that came in the group set a, set a tone that made the rest of the retreat just go wonderfully and effortlessly. Incredibly productive. Praise God. In the homes that surround our, the church's building, there are people who, who may have money, but I know they have stress, too. They have busyness. They have high expectations on their children. There is anxiety and depression. There is marital strife. There is grief. There is longing for community, but a distrust of people and institutions. As churches, we have so much to offer this community. If our hearts are open and generous with love and attention, expecting nothing in, re in, nothing in return. And I also want to say, as as an introvert who has learned extrovert skills, it, the, the idea so many know can be just absolutely terrifying. Uh, but, every, but I want to say every once in a while we need to do something. <laughs> I'm making my hand shake. It's not shaking now. You know, that, that gets our blood going. And, we, and, and it's by stepping out in faith that we see God show up. And our faith, is, our faith grows through that. I found this wonderful quote, and I can't, Find, I couldn't find the name to, to give this person uh, to attribute it to him. But I thought this really, I thought you would resonate with this. A Christian style of living that prizes intellectual vibrancy, economic generosity, and communal caring does not happen casually or automatically. It requires intentionality, effort, and choice or what the Apostle Paul called working out your salvation. Christians in the Eastern Orthodox tradition have a wonderful word for this, the Greek word nepsis, which might be translated as vigilance. The neptic believer is watchful, alert, on guard, and attentive to anything and everything that entails apostolic devotion to the Jesus way. Our purpose is, is decidedly not arid biblicism, financial guilt trips, or enlisting in a small group for the ostensible purpose of fellowship. Rather, in the words of Jesus, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. A few decades after Luke's historical description above, the Apostle Paul encouraged believers to take hold of life that is truly life and not just a pale imitation, however attractive by the world's standards. We have so much to offer the world. Let us do, do so with zeal and with joy and in the name of Jesus, just like the early apostles. In Jesus' name, amen.